From the leagues of women voters of Akron area, Greater Cleveland, Hudson, and Kent, this is Real Talk. Thank you for joining us from your offices, your homes, your hotel rooms, wherever you may be this evening. A little housekeeping first. For those joining us and needing closed caption services, they are available. Follow the instructions here highlighted with the arrow. We'll leave the screen up for just a bit. You'll also notice the resources that will be mentioned tonight will be emailed to registrants later, and that this session, like last week, is being recorded. You can go back as needed and review what we'll learn here tonight. We'll post at realtalklwd.org. Your moderator, Rick Jackson of ISTream, the public media outlets for Northeast Ohio, including WVIZPBS, 90.3 WCPN, and 104.9 WCLV, plus the large educational service programming and instruction that we provide to teachers statewide. But I'm not just here because I work on TV and radio. I come by my interest in education honestly as the son of a 35-year teacher in a large urban school system and of a family that includes seven other teachers and principals and administrators among my aunts, my uncles, my wife, and now some first cousins as well. I've heard firsthand about many of the things that you guys live in the trenches every day. I also host News Depth, the online and WVIZ educational program viewed weekly by tens of thousands of elementary and middle school students around the state, which I guess means that I teach as well, but enough of me. Let's talk about Real Talk, what is that? Real Talk is a diversity, equity, and inclusion program hosted by those four leagues of women voters in Northeast Ohio, leagues of women voters, Akron, Greater Cleveland, Kent, and Hudson. The program addresses issues of discrimination and racism, oppression, and suppression across Northeast Ohio, touching on topics from education, health disparities, criminal justice, housing and employment insecurity, environmental injustice, and democracy. This two-part education series that we're taking part in right now examines equity and how to infuse anti-racism into Ohio's 613 public school districts. So over the next hour, we're continuing our in-depth examination about the resolution to condemn racism and advance equity and opportunity for black students, for indigenous students and students of color adopted last July by the State Board of Education in Ohio. I wanna read for you again, just one paragraph of the resolution's preamble as it sets the tone for why we've gathered. It reads, as our nation grapples with the hard truths of racism and inequality, we are listening with broken hearts and engaging with determined spirits. We acknowledge that Ohio's education system has not been immune to these problems. And while we earnestly strive to correct them, we have a great deal of work left to do. Now, for those who joined us last week, we saw four current and four members of the State Board of Education examine the resolution with heartfelt intensity. To follow that, tonight we meet the innovative and committed education leaders who are operationalizing significant components of this resolution. They're approving successful institution policy changes, they're combating biases in education. In short, they're getting us started on completing that great deal of work that we have to do. Hand in hand with state leadership is the Department of Education's Committee of Practitioners, which helps inform the work regarding implementation of federal education laws, and we thank them for their input as well. Now, though, let's welcome in a familiar face, the Superintendent of Public Instruction for the state of Ohio. Paulo De Maria is already four years into being that tireless advocate for our children that we all need. Just imagine playing dad to 1.7 million kids. But he does exactly that, especially through the ODE partnership to develop the strategic plan, Each Child, Our Future. Mr. De Maria believes that everyone shares the responsibility of preparing children for successful futures. But taking that challenge personally, he's served Ohio citizens 28 years now as an organizational leader, policy expert, and education champion. His key roles have included Chief Policy Advisor to Governor Bob Taft, Director of the Ohio Office of Budget and Management, and Executive Vice Chancellor of the Ohio Department of Higher Education. Mr. De Maria earned his Bachelor of Arts summa cum laude from Furman University of Greenville, South Carolina, and a Master of Public Administration from The Ohio State University's John Glenn College of Public Affairs. Superintendent, good talking to you again. Welcome to our forum. The floor is yours. Rick, thank you so much for that great introduction. It's a pleasure uh, to be in the company of these outstanding uh, education administrators, the veritable glitterati of uh, education administration in the state of Ohio. I am humbled to be in their presence. I want to start by thanking the League of Women Voters of Akron, Greater Cleveland, Hudson, and Kent um, for, for, their, for their commitment, their dedication, their foresight 
to convene this uh, Real Talk seminar. You are doing such a service uh, to your communities, uh, your membership, uh, and all those who are interested in this vitally important topic. Um, one of the things I wanna make sure I uh, mention is that you know the board's resolution is referenced in this, but so many times you know the state government um, reflects those things that are happening out there in the field already. The men and women who you will be hearing from tonight, um, and you are in for a real treat because these are rock stars of uh, education administration, great superintendents, great administrators um, that not only uh, bring great uh, wisdom and commitment and dedication, but their, their passion for their work is what, what overwhelms me so very much. Um, and, I, and I think a lot of times what we do at the state level is we see these things already happening around us and it inspires us then in the context of other things that are happening in the world uh, to step forward and, and, and put on the table some of the words that Rick so um, uh, read so beautifully uh, and, and, that, and that move us and, and hope we inspire many, many more. So that's why I'm not gonna say very much here at the front end, because um, again, like I said, uh, you are gonna hear from some amazing administrators. John Marshhausen heads up Hilliard City Schools and does fantastic work uh, with his students and his staff in his community each and every day. Andrew Selico is in Bedford. Uh, again, also deeply committed to this work in her community. I've known Ellen McWilliams Woods, who's in Akron Public Schools for many, many, many years. And there is no one with uh, greater insight, greater passion uh, and drive to, to do excellent by her students and their community, uh, looking at data, looking at outcomes, looking at impact uh, than Ellen. And of course, Elizabeth Kirby in Cleveland Heights, University Heights, just doing incredible, incredible work in sometimes very challenging circumstances. Uh, and, uh, um, and, and each of them uh, is amazing with regard to this particular issue. Because I'm going to tell you, the work they do, and, and some of my board members might take issue with this, but the work they do is far more important than the work we do at the state level, because they are the ones that touch the lives of the students who are directly impacted by these phenomena, these conditions in our society. They're the ones that, that see the stories, that hear the stories, that hear the experiences, that see the impact of discrimination or oppression, whether it's on a micro level and in, in terms of microaggressions or implicit bias or, or on a macro level when it's you know explicit um, uh, racism or other forms of oppression. And, and, and they are the ones along with their staffs that not only observe and listen and learn, but then strategize about what actions and steps should they take to make for a better world change some of those um, issues that have become so institutionalized in our society and really move the needle and create the conditions where each child and every child can have a successful learning experience and be set on a trajectory toward reaching a lifetime of success and meeting their full potential. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay on uh, the line because I'm, I'm excited myself to listen to these illustrious leaders talk about the great work that they're doing. Um, and, and again, uh, thanks to all of you for joining. You're in for a, a real treat. Um, one of the last things I want to say, though, is I, I hope at some point, and I'm going to put this on the table for uh, the leagues that are united, um, I think it would be wonderful at some point to hear from some students. Uh, again, amplifying the point that I made before is that they're the ones that, that have such a keen awareness and understanding of, of the challenging conditions that they face and how it impacts their day-to-day -day learning experiences. And I was just thinking earlier today uh, that the students I've talked to have always been so very, very honest and frank uh, and, and, um, uh, and, and, and revealing in, um, in the experiences that they face. So with that, Rick, I'm gonna turn it back over to you and I'm excited about tonight's panel. Thank you, Superintendent, much appreciated. I love the way you put that, wisdom, commitment, dedication, and passion. Those are things that we see, I think, school buildings around the state. We see that in so much of our school leadership as well. So thank you for your kind words tonight. Now let's bring in those panelists. He gave you a hint to who some of them are. I'm gonna introduce them. They come from four systems with some similarities and many differences though. I'll introduce each briefly right now, tell you more about them and 
when they're about to speak. So the guests for this evening, leader effective systems. I'll begin with the largest system here and work to the smallest. That's more fun than being alphabetical. That said, though, we still start in Akron with Dr. Ellen McWilliams-Woods. She will speak to us first, then be followed by Dr. John Marshausen of the Hilliard Schools. Our third speaker will be Elizabeth Kirby, superintendent in the Cleveland Heights University Heights School District. And she'll be followed by Dr. Andrea Salico of the Bedford Schools, which also includes children from Bedford Heights, Oakwood, and Walton Hills. Initially, we'll hear from Dr. McWilliams-Woods. She is the Chief Academic Officer and Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction in Akron. It's the largest school system represented on our panel tonight with more than 21,000 students. Akron's diverse, about 46% Black students, 31% White, about 13 made up of Asian and Latinx youth. The community has about 190,000 residents with a medium household income of just $36,700, coverage by broadband internet for about 74% of its households. Dr. McWilliams-Woods, has been with APS in this capacity since 2008, but her time in the Akron system dates back more than 30 years beginning in the classroom. As a Medicaid consultant, she designed a new school-based Medicaid program that generated more than $1 million annually for services to students with disabilities. As assistant superintendent, Dr. McWilliams-Woods successfully secured a $9.2 million race to the top grant, elevating the Akron public schools into an innovative leading urban school system in Ohio. She was instrumental in having Akron named as the first Ford Next Generation Learning Community in Ohio, with the district's nine high schools being transformed into the College and Career Academies of Akron. And in a bit of symmetry here, you'll hear this all night, she began her career as a culturally different language specialist in the Cleveland Heights University Heights School District. Hey, Dr. McWilliams Woods earned a Bachelor of Science Wood uh, degree in audiology from Illinois State University, three advanced degrees, all from Kent State, Masters of Education in School Counseling, in Deaf Education, and a PhD in educational administration. She completed a three-year Harvard Executive Leadership Program, completed a seven-year partnership for leaders in education at the University of Virginia. Please welcome to our virtual stage, Dr. Ellen McWilliams Woods. Well, thank you so much. It is absolutely wonderful being here um, tonight and with such incredible colleagues um, and State Superintendent De Maria. We have gone back a long ways, uh, kind of enmeshed in the work that we've been doing together across the state of Ohio. Um, I, I first want to just applaud, um, and I know you all talked at the last session about the State Board of Education resolution, um, because it is such an important step for the state of Ohio to take, to boldly put out there their, um, their intent but also not just intent and words, but putting that into action. Um, and that, that's absolutely critical. We've been very fortunate in the Akron Public Schools to have leadership from our board back starting in 2017 with one of our board members, Bruce Alexander, who worked with us very closely and looked at national models across the country to have our own equity policy that really started us focused and driving the work in our district. And it was specifically around um, looking at our teaching strategies, looking at equity in terms of opportunities and in some of our hiring practices. But it really, that first stage back in 2017 focused heavily on our teaching practices. And then uh, we also passed a resolution just a year ago declaring racism as a health crisis and that also led to just this past January, taking a deeper dive into a racial equity policy so that we have the umbrella equity policy, but then moving more deeply into the racial equity policy. And that is focused again on the teaching and learning strategies, our training, our development, looking at equity and opportunities. And I'll mention some examples in a minute about that, but also student discipline, focusing on our hiring practices. I'm proud to say that we also are focusing and putting specific metrics on our supplier diversity in the district and all of the vendors that we use and how we um, do even our purchase orders on our regular supplies and looking at the diversity there and our finances and the equity across how we distribute finances um, across the district. So it's a much deeper dive uh, than we've had in the past, although it started back in 2017. 
Um, some of the key terms that I think are really critical though for us to, to hang on to from the State Board of Education resolution is that systemic inequities in education and focusing on systemic inequities. This isn't something that we can just train away. You know, this isn't more professional development and magically everything will be okay and there won't be any inequities. This is a much deeper look at systemic inequities and in the State Board of Education resolution, those courageous conversations to really look at eliminating those systemic uh, biases. And I think those are the two most important terms coming out of that. So when, when we think about that systemic inequity in the Akron Public Schools, I wanna challenge um, everyone tonight and we challenge ourselves every single day in Akron. And, and we are deep in the work, but we have a deep amount of work to go. I think I'm sure all of our panelists feel that way. But when we think about the systemic inequity for us, you know, we're, we're pushing back on this whole notion of educators feeling as though, especially in an urban district where we have a high, uh, high, very high level of poverty and a very rich, diverse uh, student body, this notion that we have to save our students, uh, particularly urban students, that students are broken and that educators have to fix them. Students who are poor or black or Latinx are the victims, the, the victims that have to be saved and rescued. All of that language that students come with their own culture, their own language that somehow starts to feel substandard, especially in the dynamics that we're all in, that we have primarily white middle-class uh, teachers and staff members working with urban, primarily in our district, Black or uh, Latinx or um, different EL, English uh, as second language learners in our district. So our students are not, you know, what, what, where we come to work every single day is pushing back against this deficit bias and looking at a strengths based. Our students aren't broken. They're absolutely brilliant. Uh, to be honest, it, they're, but it's brilliant in their own way with respect of their, the culture that they're bringing in the door and not necessarily that white middle class view and lens, but flipping it to letting the students through the experiences we're providing, let their own culture flourish and let their own passions drive where they want to infuse their culture into their learning. So, so what does that actually you know, look like? So I will argue that our students have the greatest perseverance, the greatest creative thinking skills, problem solving skills, their dedication to their own education is the strongest every single day, but we've got to be able to create those environments to let that absolutely flourish so that their own culture can be in the front of everything that they're doing. So it's bigger than just the words on this page. It's bigger than just putting a few strategies into place. That's a whole worldview uh, shift that we've been working on for a number of years in the district and we still have work to do. So, so those structures and systems that we look at. And so uh, my favorite quote from Toni Morrison in the book, uh, Beloved, she says, definitions belong to the definers, not the defined. So let me say that again, definitions belong to the definers, not the defined. So all those def definitions of at risk we use, achievement gaps, all the different testing categories that we use, all these categories that can so easily bring students down and in a deficit lens versus lifting them up. And if you even think about what we do when students test poorly on a test, we take away all of their elective courses and give them more intervention courses and we're taking more and more opportunities away. So what we've done in Akron in terms of how to approach this is to focus more on that culturally relevant pedagogy 
And that's, that's the foundation of what we do every single day, enabling students to, to identify their own learning paths with their own projects, uh, more of inquiry-based learning, project-based learning. We have, what we've done with all of our high schools is flip them into college and career academies. We were seeing in our data early on that our students from career technical education programs were flourishing. We were having graduation rates in the 95% if students were engaged in some kind of career pathway. Um, students had far less discipline issues. Everything looked so much stronger. And we ended up getting um, in this national network called Ford Next Generation Learning. And we flipped all of our high schools, nine high schools into college and career academies where students have 57 different career pathways that they choose from, where 100% of our students are in a career pathway like engineering or biomed or welding or uh, education, you know, teacher preparation uh, programs, technology, and they get, have their education with through that lens where they can identify those passions and take off and do more projects versus just sitting and kind of feeding their minds we're talking about opening their minds and letting them flourish along their pathways um, and, and along their passions. When you do that, that is culturally relevant pedagogy. That is it, because now students can take real world, real world problems out in the community in their neighborhood that is relevant to them and they can build projects around that through this career and college lens that we have them learning in. And they can use that then to solve problems, to give back to their community, and then they feel more engaged and embedded in their neighborhoods to be, to be able to you know, sh show that their neighborhood is a better place. Any of that is that culturally relevant pedagogy that we've built into our school system. And now we just passed, our board just passed uh, a middle school plan to do a very similar approach at our middle school level. Um, the other thing that we've tackled is access to higher education um, uh, through or, or access to higher level courses. And this is another systemic thing, not just offering more courses and making sure kids get in, but uh, through a program called AVID, being able to support students in those AP advanced placement higher level courses. So students are getting the study skill strategies and the support and the creative thinking strategies to be able to tackle some of those higher level uh, college bound type courses. And so we've just approved that for all of our high schools. We had it in uh, four previously, but now we're expanding that to every single high school. Um, and then the, just the last thing I'm gonna mention is on the HR human resource side, um, we really recognize and we've worked closely with our universities, but we're sort of tired of waiting <laughs> for this broader pool of diverse candidates for our teachers. Um, we know that we want a more diverse population and we have tried very hard to work with universities and recruit, but we've decided that we're putting a lot more energy on growing our own. And so we've created programs where our own staff who are non-educators who don't have the license yet, we're supporting them through getting a license. So that can be through subs who didn't come through education or through educational assistance. And we're paying for a good portion of their schooling. We're paying for mentors, we're paying for test prep, and we're stepping them through cohorts to become licensed because they're already dedicated to our kids in, district, in the district. Um, and that's also been supported by grant money through the Ohio Department of Education. Um, and we also have expanded our education programs for our students so that we can support them through college scholarships all the way through so that they can graduate and then come right back and work within our district. Um, so those are, uh, we also um, have had some wonderful support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, $1.5 million over a year to help uh, through this equity work. Half of that grant is dedicated towards these specific equity strategies um, that I'm showcasing to you. So, so that was the, the uh, quick summary of kind of the major work and especially the, 
philosophical foundation behind our strategies. Um, I think the biggest takeaway is strengths-based, not this deficit-based. If I could wipe out the words achievement gap, at risk, deficit, and get rid of all that so that we look at kids in terms of their brilliance and their what they're bringing in the door and letting their culture shine every single day. Um, that's, that is a good day in the Akron Public Schools. Dr. McWilliams Woods, thank you so much for inspiring us. I know that Ellen, you probably couldn't see the comments coming in while you were speaking there. If I could sum up a lot of them in one, it was just amen. I think what you're saying is what a lot of people wanted to hear. And for those of you who do have questions coming in, yes, we're seeing them, yes, we're taking them down. And we'll use some of those in the question and answer session. Again, Dr. McWilliams Woods, thank you for the inspiration. Next up, we're gonna hear from Dr. John Marshausen, Superintendent of Schools in Hilliard. That's community in Franklin County, the eighth largest school system in the state with 16,000 students. 71% of those are white, 9.4% Hispanic, 8% black. A far more fluent area of 94,000 people. The system's median household income is among the state's highest at $86,000. More than 90% of homes there have broadband service. Dr. Marshausen is described as having commitment to educating the whole child, to balancing academic and life skills, and to living with a mindset that prepares every student to be ready for tomorrow. He serves on the Governor's Executive Workforce Board, advising Mike DeWine in the Office of Workforce Transformation on the development, implementation, and continuous improvement of Ohio's entire workforce system. Dr. Marshausen gained his Bachelor of Arts in History and Political Science from Wittenberg University and his Master's Degree from the University of Dayton. He served on the Ohio Senate's Testing and Accountability Committee and has testified many times before the Ohio General Assembly. Dr. Marshausen, welcome to the forum. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Rick. Appreciate it. And um, it's going to be tough to follow Ellen. Um, what a bundle of energy. And, you know, Ellen, um, in Hilliard, our board, like you said, you need a supportive board to do this work. And unfortunately, as we've started this work in Hilliard, I wanna talk about some of the obstacles that we have recently faced. And I had the opportunity to testify before the State Board of Education and was actually appalled at some of the folks who testified at the State Board in opposition to ending systemic racism. And every day in Hilliard, we face hate, we face resistance, and we face people who act with a scarcity mindset. And it's not our entire community by any stretch of the imagination. But when our board in July adopted an anti-racism resolution, established multiple task forces, and I'll tell you some of the hardest conversations I've ever had to listen to were our black and brown young men and women telling me what they experienced in our school districts. And they cried with us. And after the tragedy in Minneapolis and everything that was taking place this summer, it was one of the most heart-wrenching experiences that I've been through. And our board has been steadfast to say, not only are we against forms of racism, as Ellen mentioned, we have to root out systemic racism in our schools. And I think when you're in suburban communities, and Ellen touched on this a bit, some folks think success is when you assimilate when our students of different races, of different backgrounds, act like middle, middle class white kids, that means they're doing things well. And we have to break that model. And we have to educate ourselves to break that model. In Hilliard, we've hired a diversity coordinator. And one of the things that I get to do in my time here in Central Ohio is I'm also the superintendent in residence at Ohio State University. And I get to work with the diversity and equity folks in the College of Education and Human Ecology. And we've had to bring resources in to support a community that doesn't reflect what our students look like. When you look at our principals and our administrators, it's almost entirely white men and women. And we have to change how we hire and how we recruit. And just as Ellen talked about, they're recruiting some of their own. Um, we are working with Ohio State University to recruit our high school juniors and seniors and to tap our students on the shoulder and then work with the university to say, we're going to give you mentors. We're going to help you through the program. We're going to help you become teachers 
so that they stay in Hilliard and they return to Hilliard because we've had a hard time recruiting people to come to Hilliard to do the work. Our direct, director of equity and diversity, Mrs. Samantha Chapman, has the world on her shoulders and it is amazing at what she does. As we work through a curriculum audit, as we go through our elementary book rooms and remove the literature that promotes systemic racism. And you would be shocked when you go through children's literature to see what is taking place and what's just said that we've just always let happen. So as we do this work and as we commit to live and change, my hope for the future is the current generation of students looks at things very differently than we do as, an, as adults. And we have to, in these students, prepare them to live and to thrive in a world. And they, we have to do better than we've done as an adult, as we've done as adults. So as we look at this work and we do more than pass resolutions, it's more than saying this is what we're gonna do. It takes action. And we have to, as a white educational leader, not only be an ally, but be an advocate and be able to make those changes in the face of resistance. And we face and, and deal with that resistance on a, on a regular basis. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to chat. And now, Rick, when, we, when we're done, I'm happy to answer any questions. There will be questions coming up later, and I've been watching what's been coming in. Some awesome questions. I hope you guys are prepared for that. John, thank you so much. Next up is going to be Dr. Elizabeth Kirby, who began working in the Cleveland Heights University Heights City School District just under two years ago, coming home to our native Cuyahoga County from serving as Chief of School Strategy and Planning for the Chicago Public Schools, where she spent a total of 23 years as a teacher, a principal, and a central office administrator. As network chief, Ms. Kirby provided strategic guidance to 656 district charter and contract schools, and also oversaw the district's 18 network chiefs. She's a Harvard University grad, went on to earn a Master of Arts in Social Science from the University of Chicago. Now, the schools in CHUH educate 5,000 students, of whom 71% are Black, 18% are White. The two cities house 56,000 people. The average household brings in just less than $60,000, and broadband coverage tops 84%. She was a guest on The Sound of Ideas with me on 90.3 yesterday, so I can tell you already that you're in for a treat. Please welcome in Superintendent Elizabeth Kirby. Good evening. Good evening, Rick, and thank you to the League for providing me the opportunity to share the equity story of the Cleveland Heights University High School District. Um, I think one thing that I really want to note as it relates to the equity work, um, our district was the first district in Cuyahoga County to establish an equity policy. So our board passed an equity policy in October of 2016. That was based on both qualitative and quantitative data where it was clear that there were significant achievement gaps that were happening between our black students and our white students. And I was really astounded that our board already had in place some very meaty language in an equity policy to guide the district. Um, so I'm just going to quickly go through the six elements of, of the policy and then talk a little bit more about what I've learned since returning to Ohio about equity and action on, on the state level. And the first goal area really speaks to uh, ensuring that all of our students have a high quality, high quality instruction, there are good curriculum resources in place. Um, uh, great physical and operational resources in place as well. One thing I was very impressed with coming from a big city. Is to, was to see the academic infrastructure that were that, that's in place at all of our schools, so that all of our students get um, the same curriculum exposure. We have a system of assessments where we're able to, to monitor progress of our students and make adjust, adjustments accordingly. Recently, we had a remodel of our high school and also our middle schools. And so we have quality, beautiful facilities for our students to enjoy and receive education. I can tell you just from the practitioner perspective, when you talk about closing the achievement gaps, it's really the teaching. It's really what, what happens in the classroom that really ensures that that gap closes. And so for that to be the first goal area really also shows the board's commitment to that. The second goal area really speaks to 
how we employ our staff and our resources across our buildings. So do all of our buildings have same budgets, the same opportunities, the same resources? Do they have, um, if there's a need for additional resources in some buildings based on student needs, are we able to adjust our budgets accordingly? We do have that in place in our district. We also have an, an annual staffing process where we look across our schools at the needs of the schools and staff our buildings accordingly. Third goal really speaks to offering students different opportunities to achieve success as they matriculate through our, high, our schools through the high school. So we have um, an IB program in place at many of our schools. We have AVID programs in place at our, our um, elementary schools, our middle schools and our high schools. We have um, a new CTE tech consortium where we partner and that's career and technical education. We're partnering with four other districts to provide students a wide array of classes that they can take in order to, be, to build their career in technical education uh, skills if they wanna pursue that path. We also have an outstanding advanced placement program. And I'm gonna come back to that in a moment because that's an example of, an, of our equity action, equity policy, um, a success that comes from our equity policy. Um, our fourth goal area really speaks to the professional development um, that we provide to our staff to make sure that they are able to implement um, our, our, equity, our equity policy. Not only is it professional development, but it's also making sure that we have a tool in place so that we can keep track of our progress towards the implementation of our equity policy, which is tied to student academic outcomes. The fifth goal area really speaks to ensuring that both our staff and our students receive the resources and the supports that they need so that they understand themselves in this equity work. So for example, all of our teachers have been trained in, um, have been trained in microaggressions, uh, this year our focus is, is implicit bias. We've done work around the history of marginalization. And on the student side, we have uh, dynamic programs happening across our schools. One example was this past Saturday where students from our schools participated on a panel with the NAACP and shared their reflections of the importance of African-American History Month in particular in sharing artifacts that connected, uh, connected to their lives as it relates to Black History Month. And then the final goal area is really around ensuring that we have strong community partnerships, but also a space for our families to be empowered and have voice. Um, so we have, um, you know, everything from a community learning center in development at one of our schools that we will be uh, launching soon. We have uh, two of our school sites are in a statewide consortium. They are becoming national network partnership schools where they receive research-based support in order to really strengthen family connections. We have a great partnership with Metro Health where we have a clinic at our high school that is a resource for all of our students. Um, and we have a very active and engaged family engagement task force. All of this work is driven by our equity task force, which is a collaboration of teachers, administrators, we have a board member on the task force. We have community partners on the task force. Their chief job is to make sure that we are providing the professional development that is needed to execute this policy. Um, but they also ensure that we have um, a, an eye on all these goal areas and are moving towards um, not only implementing, but refining the, the goal areas as well. So one thing I want to share, though, as it relates to equity, um, is what I've learned about equity in the state of Ohio in particular. This has been a unique year for everyone, and there are serious equity implications based on, um, you know, based on everything from the COVID-19 crisis to the way the schools are funded to uh, ed choice legislation in the state of Ohio. Let me first talk about, uh, talk about COVID. We all know that this pandemic has been the challenge of a century for all of us. One thing that I was very excited about this time last year is that we were starting to see the gap close around early literacy uh, based on the work that our teachers and our, teachers and our administrators have been doing. But guess what? We had the pandemic, schools shut down, kids come back, and all of a sudden, Here's the achievement gap again between black and white students, right? And I can only imagine what's going to happen for the rest of our students as we start to see the impact 
of COVID, given all the different instructional models all districts have been implementing. We were hopeful that the Department of Education would allow states to waive state tests this year. Um, we're hopeful, though, that the state is flexible and thoughtful as relates to state tests so that schools are not penalized for performance this year um, due to the fact that, you know, we have all been under such stress and strain. We recently brought our students back uh, for hybrid learning, but it's not all of our students. So we know that our students are having different educational experiences as students are having all across the state of Ohio in the country. So that's one opportunity for the state to step up and show some equity leadership. The second thing I learned about equity in the state that impacts our district and makes this policy hard to implement is what's happened around ed choice. So during the lame duck session, one policy that was uh, on law <laughs> that was passed uh, around ed choice and ed choice everyone knows you know we are the, the the poster child for ed choice is very contentious but there is a piece of legislation that was passed which essentially said one key component if you are a rich district you will never have to pay ed choice scholarships no matter how your kids perform on the state test so there's specific legislation that only those districts that have a certain percentage of title eligible students can even be eligible to to have to perhaps have the consequence of ed choice i don't understand if we are a state in a country that really seeks to close gaps and serve all kids why do we have a structure that punishes kids from the jump for being poor so that's a challenge Third challenge is school funding itself. So we were hopeful that fair school funding would pass. Um, we're hoping that we get some relief as we look at the budget cycle that's coming up. Um, but I am, I am a district that would love to be able to devote one position just to work on our equity work, but we don't have the money for that. We have a budget crisis. We're losing $9 million walking out the door due to Ed Choice scholarships. Our students are getting maybe a third of the state funding that they're supposed to be receiving due to that legislation. And so again, those are obstacles that make it difficult. You know, I love the resolution from the State Board of Education. I think it is powerful. I think it, it really hits the right note. But without the money, it makes it difficult to really get this work in action. And this, you know, if we don't really address and attack equity aggressively, it's not only black students or students of color or English learners that suffer, everyone suffers. Racism hurts everyone. Institutional racism hurts everyone. There may be people who feel that, you know, certain folks win in the short term, but they don't win in the long term. So this is something that we all have to work together to remedy. And it's policy, it's action, it's legislation, and it's money. So th th that concludes my remarks. You know, Superintendent Di Maria knows. You know, I am the the, the Ed Choice. <laughs> I am the face of Ed Choice. Whenever you give me a microphone, I'm going to always talk about it because it is such a hindrance to moving forward. Every bit as strong as yesterday, Liz. And I got to tell you, you have fans. You say Ed Choice in the comment sections just light up. People do want to talk about that, and we'll get to that as well. Our fourth presenter is Dr. Andrea Selico from Bedford City Schools. 3,100 students enrolled from a four town combined population of 29,600. More than 80% of the children in the schools are African American. Just more than 8% are white, 7% multiracial. The median income there, $46,000. Broadband coverage hovers at 74%. Though as we'll hear, there are places the school is creating to boost availability. Dr. Selico was also a radio guest with me yesterday. She's been superintendent since 2015, has experience in education at the elementary and secondary levels. And like Ellen and Liz, spent time in the Cleveland Heights system as well, where she was the assistant superintendent of educational services. Dr. Selico earned her bachelor's degree in elementary education at John Carroll University and her master of education degree and doctor of philosophy in urban education from Cleveland State University. Dr. Selico has held leadership positions in local and state organizations, the Ohio Association for School Personnel Administrators, Cleveland Area Minority Educators Recruitment and others. She also serves as the Executive Director of the Bedford City Schools Foundation and serves as an adjunct professor at Cleveland State University. 
So please welcome Dr. Andrea Selico. Thank you, Rick. I'm happy to be here this evening and excited to share the work that we've done around equity. So I want to begin by saying that this work hasn't uh, just started. We've actually been having these conversations since 2016, 2017. And during that time leading up to, to, to the present, um, we have held a number of professional development uh, opportunities for our uh, teachers. We've talked about culturally responsive teaching and diversity. We have taken part in poverty simulations to help address our understanding of students living in poverty. Um, we've been involved for years, as you had mentioned, um, with the Minority Recruitment Consortium, which is CAMRA. It's a Cleveland area uh, local recruitment consortium that in order to help us obtain more minority teachers and administrators. So we are dedicated to doing that and have been for a number of years. Uh, we have a strategic plan committee uh, that, that has been in the works for quite some time. And starting in around 17, we studied several instructional frameworks um, related to equity and trying to find one that best fit. And we found that the Universal Design for Learning or UDL was one that fit our needs and one in which we have adopted. Uh, we also sent teams to Wisconsin to receive level one and level two training on equity. Um, and, and that's the ICS Integrated uh, Comprehensive Systems for Equity. And again, that's with Elise Ratura out of Wisconsin. And um, that is a multiple day commitment. And we sent a number of our staff members to bring back the information and to help lead our initiative on equity. We also have had two equity audits completed in years prior. Uh, I wanna start um, with the infographic, if we could um, show that. Yes, this infographic, thank you, is something that was started in just the summer of 2020. And we created this as an illustration of a, of a roadmap that tells our story on how we got started with our work. And I'm just going to walk you through it and talk about each step on our journey as we go. So first we started our, our conversations, although again, I mentioned that we've had numerous conversations prior to this, but the death of George Floyd was really the catalyst for our conversation among our administrative team with act the actual desire to make a change, not just to continue to talk about it or provide professional development, but to really take a stand and make a, a strong statement. So we started to investigate our social justice work or start our work and tie it into our equity framework because we really saw how the two fit together. And so on the next slide that I will share, I will um, go more in depth about that and, and show you the connection. But we decided we had to start somewhere. And where do you start? But with a mission, a vision. So we started with our mission, a vision, also a tagline and the logo that you see there. So our tagline, as you can see, is Bearcats Building Bridges to Social Justice. And there is our, um, our logo that accompanies that. Our mission is to inspire change through courageous conversations. And I think I heard that in a previous, um, someone speaking previously about courageous conversations. Our vision is to build bridges between our students, parents and community stakeholders so that we can come together to discuss significant social justice issues in order to foster a culturally responsive environment in our schools and community. So here you see the link between our schools and communities. So we're trying to bridge that, not just have the discussions in our schools, but also in our communities. And as Rick had mentioned, we have four communities that are all actually quite different in their own right. The next step on our journey is, uh, and again, I believe I, we heard this earlier as well, which we recognize that we had a need and need, perhaps needed some assistance in getting started and also someone to just guide us and lend, lend their expertise on race related issues and social justice and equity and anti-racism. And so therefore we hired a part-time consultant who has been working with the district and that has been a, a benefit to us. Our next stop was, uh, and has been embedded in it and ingrained in our work and has continued for years. But again, to mention our staff professional development in which we've offered many opportunities relative to uh, covering implicit bias. We heard that earlier, culturally responsive teaching and diversity, just to name a few. Along those same lines, then uh, going a little a step further is that we took part in, in book talks as well as movie viewings. And so the, the one book talk that we did among our administrative team was white fragility. And so we that was, uh, again, a catalyst for conversation and a good uh, starter to get us into this work. We also had uh, two movie viewings and COVID threw us for a little bit of a, a <laughs> put a little monkey wrench into our plan, which is we planned to have the entire district together in the auditorium watching a movie together. 
but instead we watched it online. And then afterwards we had conversation and it was a debrief around uh, racism and social justice issues. And the two movies that we watched are 13th and America's Son. And I highly recommend, especially America's Son, um, just a very moving movie, very powerful. And I would say that in my 25 years, this was probably one of the most impactful professional developments and discussions that I have been part of. And to watch a staff emote in the way that they did and how it just evoked such raw feelings and expressions from our staff was just amazing to watch. But it, and it left peop, people wanting more. So that was probably one of the most powerful things we did and will continue to do. Uh, so those are just two, of, two examples. And similarly, we took those two movies, The 13th and America's Son, and we did a similar format, but with our community. So we are hosting a minimum of three is our goal to community forums. We've had two and our third is in the works, but we've invited numerous people from anyone from the community can attend. So we've had city officials, council, mayors, uh, parents all uh, join and, and that have been invited. And again, we have um, had those forums with an open discussion after the community members watched each one of those movies and we came and discussed and our consultant uh, moderated the line of questioning about the movies. So that was also an impactful, um, I thought an impactful um, event. And next we were, and actually this isn't really next because it came prior to some of this, but uh, we threw it in there, which is that we, uh, when this was all happening around George Floyd, Floyd we um, decided that we were going to have a mural painted by our high school students and faculty. And so that is in the main entrance and it is a Black Lives Matter mural. And it's our, excuse me, it's our, at our high school main entrance. And we did not want to put this somewhere discreet. We wanted it to be on display and we wanted it to be in a heavily trafficked and viewed area. So we chose a very, uh, uh, an area that is highly, highly traveled. So that uh, is, has another nice event that uh, took place. Our next stop was with our lead diversity program. Uh, we sent a district representative to this lead diversity program and it's through our diversity center of Northeast Ohio, kind of a train the trainer model Whereas uh, he will go through a 10 month program and learn about advocacy and with inclusion and equity and all, um, and the various various other things that will come back and come back to the district and share that knowledge and hopefully lead our efforts uh, as well. And then uh, included in all of this work, we, it was our in our strategic plan, which I believe I referenced at the beginning, and that is that we've had a strategic plan for um, this is our second plan since I've been here in six years. But our first plan did not include its own goal on social justice and equity, and this time we have one. So we're just starting the work in our, in our second plan, but our goal for the strategic plan is that all uh, BCSD stakeholders will be challenged to engage in opportunities that are culturally responsive and eliminate inequalities. So we're just beginning that work. And then we also uh, created a leadership advisory team, which I will discuss, it's on the next slide, so I, I'll I'll save that my remarks for that. And then lastly, we're in the process of creating student groups and we're working on establishing uh, leaders and students to emerge in their own behalf and advocacy around social justice as well as other uh, groups that have been marginalized. So we are excited to get those underway. We're in the beginning stages of getting those established. And then just to mention a couple other things that you don't see in our infographic of things that we've done we are currently in the early stages of participating in another equity audit process and that's in training through our local ESC, Educational Service Center. We also have been trying to keep this conversation alive and not just sporadically throwing things into the, to the mix just so people can be reminded, but to keep it systemic, to keep it ongoing and on the forefront of people's minds about anti-racism and social justice and the injustices that we're seeing. So we've sent a number of letters and statements to our community and also posted them on social media. And in doing so, we're trying to take positions. We're also trying to educate the public, create awareness, and also encourage people to reflect. And some of the statements that we've put out included uh, the death of George Floyd, uh, Juneteenth, Black History Month, and also the insurrection at the Capitol. We did, I did have a statement that went out uh, regarding that. We also created a draft of an equity policy. I heard others mention that this evening. And I wish we would have started this years ago, but it's, it's, it's in the works now and I'm happy to see that. And that will go for the first reading to the Board of Education in March. 
So we're hoping to get that passed. We also, in um, what you'll see in the next slide here, is that we created an equity framework and social justice map um, framework. So at this time, I'll share with you that if we can. Thank you. Um, this, this framework was created by our um, equity and diversity leadership advisory team that I mentioned earlier. And as you'll see, there are four cornerstones, each of which uh, has a member of an advisory team that oversees a subcommittee of, and that's comprised of district representatives. And I should also mention that this framework that you see, and for the purpose of this presentation, was scaled back. So I removed a number of bullet points and non-negotiables for the sake of um, not cluttering the screen as well as for the sake of time. I don't have time to go through the whole framework, but if you are interested in viewing that, you can uh, see it on our website. So starting with the first cornerstone, what you see there is the focus on equity and social justice. So what you might see in this quadrant and the, and the work with the subcommittee that the work that they're doing is around the history of marginalization. You'll find research here. Our audit is something that would fall under here and our non-negotiables, as well as all of our work around the social justice and the things that I mentioned in the infographic. The second cornerstone is aligning staff and students, whereas we will see scheduling and staffing and realigning our staff to address equity uh, needs and issues. And then you'll see in, in cornerstone three, transforming teaching and learning. And of course, this is where it all happens. And this is where we co-plan co to co-serve our students. And here you will see the universal design of learning, our multi-tiered systems of support and our positive behavior intervention supports um, among many other things to address equity. Then uh, lastly, in, in, in uh, number four, you see leveraging policy and funding. And this is where the creation of our equity policy stemmed from. We also, in this, that's very important, and I heard others mention this, is the alignment of resources. And again, it doesn't always mean that every school is going to get the same allocation. It's going to be based on needs, the individual uh, needs of students, as well as the buildings. And so we are committed to doing that to ensure equity among our students. The non-negotiables were drafted uh, that you see below our, uh, we were in, drafted in our committee uh, after a training in Wisconsin and we vetted them with various groups and then we presented them at individual staff meetings for their input. And we actually have a total of eight, but in the full framework, again, you will see them as well as we list icons symbolizing the alignment between the non-negotiables and the cornerstones. So you're able to see the connections that are made as we're trying to show our staff how this all connects and how it ties together. So in closing, I guess I would just add that the idea of uh, being equitable for us in Bedford schools is about meeting people where they are at and just ensuring that they have what they need in order for them not to be excluded from opportunities available to those that have the requisite resources due to their personal circumstances. And our district is committed to providing equitable access and ensuring that fairness, equity, and inclusion um, are essential principles of our district. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Selico. And thank you all. Having heard from the four systems who've shared some very innovative and some very successful ways of combating bias and racism, we've come to the part of the program where we're a little bit less structured, more free-flowing conversation with all four of them. And actually, Paulo de Maria is still with us, so we can include five. Uh, this is not for comparison, this is for collaboration. I've been watching the questions come in, some awesome questions, which I'll try and weave into the questions that I put together. I spent hours doing this, folks. I'll weave your questions in anyway. But panelists, go ahead and jump in when you hear things that you want to comment on or, or even disagree with. To begin, though, let's not consider the students for a moment. Let's consider the wider population inside our school buildings, because if we don't see the biases that we all admittedly have, if we don't examine our own behaviors, we can't teach, at least we can't teach well. John, we haven't heard from you in a while. I'll let you start. You have the fewest minority student representation of the four panelists here. And we've had some questions come in specifically about Hilliard and if I could call it your whiteness. So how are you specifically asking your staff to face up to inherent tendencies to unintentionally fall into those traps of belief, certainly when they don't see the kids that we want to address here sometimes? Well, I think the most important thing we can do is listen to our students who are our black and BIPOC students. Um, all of our buildings have a number of students um, from different ethnic groups. We have a large Muslim population. We have to stop and listen to the experience that our students are having and giving those students a voice and understanding how they feel and how they feel is real. And the experiences that they are having in our schools are real. 
And as we listen to them, we have to provide not only the training, but the opportunities and hold our teachers accountable for the behavior that they not only take, but that they share and permit in their classrooms. We say, if you permit it, you promote it. And there are times in districts like ours where you still deal with Confederate flags, you still deal with symbols of hate. And if you permit those things, you promote that behavior. So even in a white suburb where we are predominantly white students and staff, we have to change our conversations and listen to the students in our district. They have an incredible voice. And recently we've found ourselves in some pretty contentious situations and dealt with some, some high media attention because of what we are doing. And you have to keep doing the hard work because this isn't going to be easy. This isn't going to be a one year, a two year. This is a decade generation long effort that we all have to undertake and we have to do it from our hearts. And you can't do this halfway. Ellen, you have a much more diverse group. The stats I have talk about students. Stats I do not have talk about the makeup of the staff. You know, how many African American, how many Latinx teachers do you have, or other staff members, administrators, et cetera? What do you see? Do you agree with what John was saying? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think um, it's critical to get that student voice, and that actually sometimes breaks through a lot of the. Um, kind of the book study that can happen um, and people can feel comfortable in the trainings, but it's very different when you're hearing real life stories from students and hearing that student voice of the experiences they're having every single day. Um, you know, I think, and quite a few of the chats are talking about, you know, what is it that moves staff to action? Um, I think training is good, that's important, but I will tell you, we have trained to death in the academic schools over the years. Um, and, and training alone, especially, doesn't always move those beliefs and most importantly, those practices. Um, and so the structures and systems you put in place that force the, the practices to change is where you have to get in terms of the action-oriented strategies, similar to um, access to the higher level courses. All day, we can train teachers to eliminate biases on who they're recommending for higher level courses or who they're, but in, until you put a structure in place where it takes out that subjective nature of identifying students and you make more uh, data-driven, and you push students that typically would not be considered for higher level courses and you put supports in place, until you just do that as an automatic system, you're gonna have this perpetual training of staff to try to get them to recognize their uh, biases. That's important, don't get my sarcasm wrong, <laughs> but you could live in that world all day long where the bridge that you're trying to get them to becomes the concrete road that you never get there. So you do, you have to put structures and systems in place to hold people accountable to the practices that you need. The other thing that we're doing um, is uh, we're putting a heavy investment into the intercultural development inventory, which is a personal inventory that teachers take. And then we contract with local trained certified people that come and do individual consultation sessions on their cultural competencies. Um, those conversations are deeper, more personal, uh, tearful, gut-wrenching conversations, but you end up with an action plan um, individually that you look at to try to keep your own competency moving forward. We're seeing better results with that type of approach versus one more global session on uh, diversity. Thank you. I'm going to use an audience question here. Elizabeth, I'm going to throw this one at you to start. It says for anyone on the panel, though, what would you recommend as a starting point for a group of teachers who created a diversity inclusion equity committee in the school? It goes on to say the school is small, highly diverse. But the amount of work that needs to be done on a systemic level feels overwhelming. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, the good news is there are a lot of um, entities that are starting to do this work now. You know, four years ago when our policy was instituted, you didn't have the explosion of a diversity, equity, inclusion organizations, trainers, partners, um, or even a passion for doing this work. So one thing that I would certainly say is to investigate models similar to the school community that you are currently working in to see what are some of the best pathways in order to really get that work moving. So that, that's one. Secondly, it's really important that um, everyone within a school community understands the why of the work. Why is this work so important? What are the experiences that the students are, ha are having? What are the data telling us about the experiences of our African-American students um, in, in our school, our students who are of Latino origin in our school? What are, what are the kids saying about their experiences? So we, we need to, to really understand that why, because it will help in terms of identifying the strategies and the structures that need to be in place in order to really get that work going. And the third thing that I would say is, please know this work is not easy. It's gonna be difficult. And you have to be courageous to really engage deeply in the work. And, and anyone who's really gonna do this for real has to be ready for that. You have to know this is courageous work. It can be lonely work. Um, and you'll, you will need, a, I'm great to hear it's a committee of teachers working together to push this forward. You know, a lot of the, the, this work around equity and, and diversity and anti-racism, it's, you know, there's a group component, group professional development component, but it's also personal. It's one-on-one -on -one conversations, it's exposure. So I love a lot of these strategies that my panelists are sharing everything from, you know, book talks to movie nights, to conversations, to inventories, to honest conversation. Um, all really important. And then the final thing that I would that I would say is this is not short work. You don't do it in a year. You don't do it in five years. Like this is really long, a long, uh, long lens of work. And the bigger your district, the longer that it's going to want to take. But stay the course because it's going to make it a, a really big difference in the lives of students. But it's also going to make a really big difference in the lives of adults and their experiences too. Thank you for that. Getting a lot of questions about the Akron schools, Dr. Ellen McWilliams Woods. Um, and one of those is you mentioned that since 2017, the hiring process has changed in the APS. Uh, how have you changed the system? I'd love to hear from you and some of the others as well. Uh, in terms of our hiring practices, um, that is, uh, has been transformational work and continues to be transformational work and will future be transformational work because that is a huge rock um, for us. One of the major shifts that we made um, is the way that we were recruiting and getting, uh, someone already meant, mentioned the camera organization and getting to um, a lot more of the minority recruitment organizations across the country to be able to be more embedded, historically black colleges to be able to recruit there. But locally, when we looked at the local universities, that's where we were struggling in terms of the pool and trying to work with them to make sure that we were getting the diverse candidates in for student teaching and to get them embedded in our district early on as we are watching their pools of candidates shrink, that's where we really shifted gears more towards growing our own and building our own um, and looking at supporting our own students through the uh, college process to come back and then work for us. And then looking at our own educational assistants and substitutes and other staff that we could support um, because they were already dedicated to the district. Now, the current work that we're doing under the leadership of Dr. Akbar, who I think is uh, uh, listening in, who is our current board president, um, who is an expert in the area of diversity. If anybody needs to reach out to him, he works at Kent State University and he's been a great value to the district to take our work to the next level. We're also really carefully examining um, and we're doing an audit uh, soon here this year on our, some of our human resources practices, like the screeners that we use that oftentimes can be barriers to candidates to come through into the district. So those practices, we're taking a look even further to figure out how to eliminate the barriers, even if the pool is smaller from the colleges, 
uh, we want to make sure that we don't put any other artificial barriers. Administratively, we, we have a much more diverse uh, administrative team, and that's because we've done all of our Grow Your Own. Uh, we put leadership development programs in place that we support uh, pay tuition and tap people to go on to college, and we help pay for tuition. So that, and we do cohorts in our district, and then we do our own kind of internal process with Cleveland State University so that they come right back and work with us. And those have been the most successful to really uh, expand the diversity of our own workforce. Thank you. Yeah, John mentioned the Grow Your Own on his segment as well. So Dr. Selick, I'm gonna to go to you. What, uh, what changes have you made in trying to bring in a different type of staff? So oh, again, um, as I mentioned, we and uh, that we talked about with the camera recruitment um, consortium, we've been a part of that for a while. That's one example. But just like um, Ellen had mentioned, the historically black, black colleges, we've tapped into them. We've tried to grow your own to do the grow your own. We've tried to introduce people to um, uh, scholarship opportunities. Uh, we've tried to promote from within you know, and try to get folks um, interested that maybe aren't teachers, maybe paraprofessionals that could find the, you know, we can get them, help them get the credentials that they need. Uh, but as, as we know, it is very difficult to uh, find minority teachers. And so, um, as we had mentioned as well, the, the local colleges, um, you know, while they're, help, they're, they're helpful, and our partnership with Cleveland State, for example, is a great one, we're just not getting um, the the pool that we would like to see. So same challenge as everyone else and probably nothing um, extraordinary that other people have not already mentioned. Thank you. Question for Superintendent DeMaria. I ask, are you optimistic the state legislature will pass fair funding for public schools and stop defunding public school districts via the Ed Choice vouchers? I don't want to get Elizabeth started again, but the question is <laughs> directly to you. Well, uh, you know, I, I mean, on the one hand, there are some very promising signs. Uh, the House of Representatives passed the fair school funding plan mm -hmm. at the end of last year, uh, and it was just there was just too short a time period left in the session uh, to get it done. I have heard Speaker Cup uh, talk about uh, and, and House Bill one has been introduced, which kind of shows you the priority it is mm -hmm. uh, for the House side to pass the fair schools funding plan. I know it's already been receiving committee testimony. So and I've heard people say that the, the House plans to pass both the separate legislation and then in their version of the budget, uh, factor it in. I, I think what's what's a question mark right now in my mind is where the Senate uh, is. But I think I think they are also thinking about. I, I think they understand the need in Ohio. Uh, it's the the details that I think we are uh, uh, we are uh, looking forward to. Thank you. Hey John, we all read the pushback earlier this month about the private school in Utah that initially allowed parents to opt their kids out of Black History Studies for February until they got caught. Have you seen anything like that in the districts where you are, districts surrounding you? Has there been pushback? And what do you do if there is? It's happened in Hilliard. We've had parents come when there are specific times for diversity and equity training where parents come and sign their children out of school. And when they mm -hmm. come and sign them out, at first we it was a sur surprise, a shock. And now there are consequences. You're, you're absent from school and school is a mandatory compulsory thing for the state of Ohio. Um, so we have to explain what the consequences are when you miss school, but we do have parents who will sign their kids out of school. When we diversified our literacy collection for mandatory reading in our high school books, we have some students who, some parents who request other books if they don't like the books that their students are assigned to read in English 10 or English 11. So we find ourselves fighting, um, again, uh, it, it's, not, it's not a majority of people, but it's enough to make you angry. It, it's enough to be frustrating. And that's why it's so important that we continue to be steadfast, um, that we don't uh, cave to some of the pressure and that we do recognize it is a free society. Parents do have some options available to them, um, but we have to be really careful and really vigilant with the work that we do. And I'll just throw one more thing out there. I know this is really important to Paula right now. I think we may be talking about it more on Friday. Um, as we look at the impact of COVID, 
and some of the panelists have mentioned how, mm -hmm. how vocabulary matters. We can't talk about COVID gaps. Mm -hmm. We can't talk about recovery plans. We have an opportunity as we come out of this global pandemic to be better than we were before we went into the pandemic. When you look at our numbers, we weren't serving all of our kids well in 2018 and 2019. And part of that is we weren't valuing who they were, what their values are, who, and all of those things that Ellen talked about before. So as we look at, and we're gonna call it our bridge program, as we build bridge programs for a post COVID world, we have a tremendous opportunity to not only build in academic foundations, but social emotional foundation, foundations, equity foundations, all of these different parts and pieces that are at our core, we've got now some resources and an opportunity to come out of COVID better than we were before. And we have to take advantage of this time in history because we get to shape the future. And it's a great opportunity for us. Thank you, John. And as you were speaking there, I was watching some of the comments from viewers. And they were saying pretty much, it's not just Hilliard, it's happening in other places too. One comment even came from Virginia, I believe saying it's happening here. I was looking over to Elizabeth, she was just shaking her head, which just basically yeah. underscores everything you were saying. But Elizabeth, I wanna ask, how do we get parents to buy in? You've got a more diverse system than he does, but how do you get parents to buy into what we wanna teach? Well, um... One thing that I mentioned in my opening comments, uh, the work of anti-racism and the work of equity really makes all of us better and it ensures that students receive a whole education, right? So um, I went to an elite college and university where people understood that it's important for kids to have a well-rounded and full education. And so if I were the parent of a white child, I would insist that my child also learn African-American history, Latin American history, history of Asian Americans, because that makes them a better individual. They're better able to participate in a democratic society. Um, and I think that a lot of times we, when, when we talk about equity, there's a tendency to, to look at it from a perspective of winners and losers, as if someone's going to lose, you know, if we don't, um, if we start to focus on a, another, uh, a history of another uh, group of color. But we all win when we all know each other. You know, I'm from Chicago. Well, I, I was there for 25 years. And there was, even before the death of George Floyd, Laquan McDonald uh, was murdered by a police officer in Chicago. And the entire situation was horrible. And I found myself really thinking about, I wonder what the educational experience of the police officer who ended up going to jail was. Mm -hmm. And I suspect because you know he was from Chicago and Chicago's most segregated city in the country, he probably didn't have a lot of exposure um, to African-American students, African-American history, African-American culture. And when we look at the challenges around police brutality across our country, I think what we often see again is um, there's people aren't, they don't have that exposure, they don't have that knowledge, and they become not only uh, perpetrators of violence, but we also become victims of their own stereotypes. So this this work around equity is important for all of us. It's important for our society. And quite frankly, rather soon, we are gonna be a country that is a majority minority. Um, so there's a, there's a rational choice reason to make sure that this is work that we all embrace and that we all understand. This is about the viability and the survival of our nation too. So by hook or by crook, you know, we all have to embrace this work because it's gonna be important for all of us. But ultimately, you know, this is about, you know, being a full, a full human being, fully connected. Um, and this, this work is so important. When, when, you know, we're all intimately connected. So um, as I'm successful, other people are successful. When one child is successful, other students also experience the fruits of that success too. And we have to remember how powerful 
that symbiotic relationship is. If I could jump in just for a second, one of the things we get tagged with is they say we're indoctrinating their children. But when you look at the definition of indoctrinization, we've been indoctrinating kids about white European views of history since any of us went to school, because the only thing we've ever taught is the white European view of history. So I get to talk to parents and say, no, we're not indoctrinating your children. In fact, we're enlightening your children because now we're looking at American history through the lens of a enslaved person who was forced into slavery when they came here. We're looking at history from a Native American perspective. We're looking at history through a recent Somali immigrant perspective. What we were doing before was indoctrinization. What we're doing now is opening people's eyes and that's part of the education process that we have to continue to talk about. Superintendent DeMaria, a lot of people were saying, we can't have 600 different ways of doing things. And yet right now we do seem to have 600 different ways of doing things. Is there, there is no one size fit all, but is there a way to make Ohio more cohesive? Well, you know, I think I, I uh, celebrate the great diversity across the state, but I also think it goes back to one of the, one of the slides about, you know, some things are non-negotiable. Uh, and and uh, issues like this uh, fall into that category. So, um, you know, and, and again, I, I think a great takeaway from tonight's session is there are places with, you know, a, a very different places represented here tonight that are doing great work and that more and more districts need to, uh, and I think are and will continue to be, understanding the realities that they face, understanding what good practice looks like, undertaking the work as challenging as it may be, uh, and, and, and leading the, the transformation that has to occur across our state. So I'm, I'm encouraged, um, and, um, uh, and, and yet I think it can happen uh, in different contexts and different circumstances uh, and, uh, and in different ways. So many great questions. I only have time for a couple of more. Um, Andrea, let me throw this one at you wants to know if there are comprehensive programs or plans in your school or others you know of to aggressively reach black parents, to recruit them to the PTA, the PTO, something similar. Uh, are there resources going out to black churches in the community? What are you doing to reach the outside world from the school system? Well, I can speak for my experience of as superintendent, whereas I meet with our clergy, um, which many are minority pastors. Um, so I meet with them four times a year I also meet with our mayors four times a year and our city councils on occasion. I have an advisory council as well that meets quarterly. And so what we try to do is bring in a variety of diverse, um, we're always looking at diversity in any task force or any committee that we create, we are always looking to diversify our, um, our groups that, um, that we create. And so we try to, we find value obviously in having the various um, perspectives. So. We have that. Uh, we also um, have outreach. We have social workers that reach out to our families. We have community uh, communications department that reaches out um, to various groups. Um, and then we also have a parent group. We have started, we've tried numerous parent programs, um, none of which I could say were extremely successful, but we've tried numerous different, uh, different approaches. Um, relative to parent ambassadors, parents uh, beyond, we were trying to get beyond PTA, but we did have a very difficult time recruiting um, families. But we do have a program through Beachbrook, which is one of our local uh, mental health agencies that works with parents on a regular basis. Uh, we had 15 families that meet for about 10 weeks at a time. And so we continue to run that session and it's a good bonding experience for them as well as uh, an extra resource for, for families in need. Thank you so much. I'm getting the high sign, folks, that our time is short. So let me thank this incredible panel by sharing with you some of their contact information. You can reach out with any questions you may have specifically. And I know there's at least 20 questions I didn't get to that weren't specifically answered tonight. Thank you so much to Dr. Ellen McWilliams Woods of the Akron Schools, to Superintendent Elizabeth Kirby of Cleveland Heights University Heights, to Superintendent Dr. John Marshhausen of Hilliard City Schools, to Superintendent Dr. Andrea Selico of Bedford. Can't begin to thank you enough for this robust start to what will be a years long conversation. Again, to our viewers, all of this information will be forwarded along after the sessions end and the list of resources will be as well. 
here to tell you specifically what you can do to offer more about the resources is Susie Kayser, the Education Specialist for the League of Women Voters Ohio. Susie. So um, Liz, you're not the only one that cares about school funding. Um, that is a high priority of the League of Women Voters. And as the Education at, um, Specialist for the League, uh, I focus on school funding. And for, for all of you who need to know, um, uh, the House Bill 1, as uh, the superintendent noticed, uh, noted, is now um, in the um, House uh, Finance Subcommittee on Elementary and Secondary Funding. Um, it, um, it, it, is a, it truly is a fair school funding plan. It is what brings equity. It solves the equity issue that is dominates the problems with our school funding at the current time. It does this in four important ways. Um, it increases the base cost. We can't let that disappear from um, the $6,060 that we currently go by. It's now raised to between seven and 8,000. Uh, it uses two different variables to determine how much each community can afford to pay. Um, so it will be much more precise in supporting the poorest school districts. Um, it more than doubles the categorical aid for children living in poverty. And finally, thank goodness, it would end deduction funding for vouchers and charter schools. So the, the kind of financial um, craters that uh, privatization has created for local school districts would go away if this um, bill is approved. So um, <clears throat> what we can do is we need to, as uh, the, the issue seems to be, uh, the big, it passed the House very generously. The question is, will it make it through the Senate? So what we can do is um, call your local, your, your state senator, let them know uh, that you want a fair system, you want them to pass the bill, and that you want them to guard against any budget trade-offs that undermine these four core features of this bill. So I urge you to also um, recruit your elected officials in your community, both your school and municipal government to advocate for House Bill 1, because this is a community issue, not just an education issue. Um, so this is extremely important that we get this bill passed. This is our moment. And um, as we know, equity cannot be achieved without it. Um, <clears throat> The, the League of Women Voters in general urges you to advocate with your local school district. If you like what you heard tonight, if your school district is doing it, attend a school board meeting, tell your board that you appreciate what they're doing and offer to assist and find ways in which the community can support them in achieving these goals. Um, <clears throat> if, you, if you don't have this happening in your community, go to your school board meeting and ask for it. We have terrific models here and we have a state policy, both of which are um, great starting points. So uh, there are many things that we can do to make sure that, that equity is advanced. And I'm really grateful to the, all the work that all of you are doing. The, the league also encourages, uh, we have wonderful resources uh, for ways to, to participate. It's really helpful to be well-informed uh -huh. The Ohio Channel is a great way to learn what's going on. Be sure to speak up and bring your friends. And again, all this information will be forwarded on to those of you who've registered for the session tonight. Thank you, Susie. Special thank you to Dr. Dee Maria for being with us as well for this night. We hope it's been enlightening for all of you. We hope it's been inspirational. Get those creative juices flowing. It all works better when we work collaboratively, and it all works better when we're working with the kids first and foremost in our hearts. For the Leagues of Women Voters of Northeast Ohio, I'm Rick Jackson with IdeaStream. I'll talk to you tomorrow on the radio on 90.3 WCPN. Until then, thank you so much.